Eggerling organ. I said, um, you know, a lot of the sexual apparatus for insects is on the tip of the abdomen. And insects, a lot of insects, when they lay their eggs, the egg comes out of the tip of the abdomen. And some insects have evolved, instead of just laying the egg, to inject the egg into something. And some of the insects, that thing that injects the egg has evolved to be uh, a stinger instead of an egg injector. Um, so these pictures here are examples of parasitic wasps, and their lifestyle is to go around, find insects that they feed on, and inject their egg into an insect. And they have this little injector at the tail at the tail end. Now I, I've been studying insects for 50 years. There's so much to learn. And I've never been quite clear on these parasitic wasps that have this egg layer at the end. Can that sting you? I'm still, I'm not sure. In fact, I was looking it up the other day and I think, I think I read somewhere that most of them can't and maybe a few can. But in my 50 years of insect collecting, I've just never experimented with it. I've caught a lot of parasitic wasps in my time. I get them in my net, I get a jar, I put that in there, and I never reach in the net and pull them out of my hand and throw them in the jar. So I just don't want to take the chance. <laughs> so if you're interested in answering that question, you might want to look up sometime because I don't have the final answer for you. But I believe, for the most part, they don't, they can't sting you, but it looks scary enough that I'm not going to pull around with it. So, um, so I'm going to talk quick, quick talk about the life cycles of insects. Um, you know, and again, most people are familiar with this term, life cycle. The insect goes from a stage from the egg becomes an insect and eventually becomes an egg again at some point. But the way that it does that, naturally, like everything else, there's all different kinds of examples of different things that different insects do. It couldn't be just simple. Everyone knows, oh yeah, a butterfly came from a cocoon or a chrysalis, before that was a caterpillar, before that it was an egg, and the butterfly lays the egg and there's the cycle. Uh, wouldn't it be so simple if a uh, million different kinds of insects, they all did that? Well, they don't. <laughs> so it's not, it would be simpler and easier to remember if that's the case. It wouldn't be as interesting. Uh, there are basically, you know, I've got a question there, how many different types of life cycles are generally recognized? And most textbooks will tell you four. Four. Most insects you can classify as having this life cycle, or this, or this, or this. The simplest, and I always start out with the simplest, right? The simplest mouth parts, the simplest uh, wings. The simplest kind of life cycle is called the ametabolous life cycle. And what this means is the insect starts out as an egg, it progresses to become an adult, and the adult lays its egg again, and not a whole lot visibly happens from egg to adult, other than what hatches out of the egg looks like a tiny little miniature adult. And as it sheds its skin and gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it gets bigger and doesn't look much different from the little guy, except that the little guy doesn't have sexual organs, so it couldn't lay an egg. And the big guy does, and that's pretty much what changes through its life during the ametabolism cycle. The young looks very similar to the adult, but the sexual organs develop through the cycle. So to get a little more confusing, we have what's called the hemimetabolous life cycle. And this is similar to the ametabolism. You've got an egg and a little guy hatches out and sheds its skin and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The little guy doesn't have sexual organs, and the adult does, so that's one thing that changes. 
the little guy looks kind of similar to the adult, except most of the adults that have this kind of life cycle have wings when they're adults. So as the little guy's growing up, and the little guy's called a nymph, as the little guy's growing up, each time it sheds its skin, if you were looking carefully, you could see the wings starting to develop on the outside of the body. They start out as little tiny buds on its back. And then it sheds its skin, and the buds are a little bit bigger. And it sheds its skin, and the buds are a little bit bigger. And by the time it sheds its skin the last time, fully developed wings are there, and fully developed sexual organs. So the hemi-metabolus is different from the a-metabolus, basically the addition of wings developing on the outside of the insect as it progresses through its cycle. Now this cycle, the third cycle, called the poro-metabolus, is A little different still. And how is this different? Well, it starts out as an egg. A little guy hatches out of the egg. And it sheds its skin and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it also has little wing buds on the outside, as you can see. But when it becomes the adult, the adult is significantly different from the young. Um, it doesn't just look like the young with big wings. You know, you look at the body of the dragonfly nymph and the body of the dragonfly adult, very different shape. Um, usually in insects that have a poor metabolic lifestyle, the, the whole life of the adult, the life situation of the adult is different from the young. Um, the young for a dragonfly live underwater. They're aquatic. They breathe of gills. When the adult dragonfly hatches out, it's terrestrial. It flies. Uh, it doesn't have gills anymore. Um, so the adult looks considerably different from the young. But while it's young, it goes through these different stages, and then it sheds its skin, and the adult comes out. So our last life cycle, the one that most people are familiar with, the hollow metabolus, is like the butterfly thing. It starts out as an egg. Some young insect hatches out of the egg, which is a grub or a caterpillar or uh, a maggot or something like that. The grub grows up, goes through, starts out little, gets bigger, 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 bigger. Then it goes into a resting stage. This is what makes this different from the poro metabolus before. It goes into a resting stage where the larva turns into the adult. Remember the dragonfly nymph was a nymph, and then it crawled up on a rock, and the dragonfly <coughs> hatched right out. Didn't go through a resting stage. Something like a beetle or a butterfly or whatever, it's the larva, and then it hunkers down, becomes the pupa. And the pupa pretty much dissolves inside. All the internal organs of the larva dissolve. And then they grow back into the internal organs of the adult. And then, when it's ready, the adult hatches out. And it's ready to lay its egg. <coughs> so if you took um, the, a larva right when right when it first makes its pupa, and you cut it open, it would have the guts of the larva inside. And if you waited until halfway for the transition from the larva to the adult, depending on how long that pupa stage takes, if you knew 
Purity Sage takes a month. If you waited two weeks and you cut it open in two weeks, it would just be soup inside there. And then if you cut it open the day before the adult, adult hatches, you'd see all the internal organs of the adult. So it's real interesting that way. But his life goes in this cycle. So we talked about the four life cycles. They all go from egg to adult. And all this stuff that happens in between is different depending on what kind of life cycle the insect has. So that was the biology of, inse of insects. Um, do you want, you say you usually have to break at about 10.30? Um, sure. You want to, Trent will have, have a break now, sure. and then we'll get into the life of the shrimp insects, what's going on. So I tend to get long-winded and digress and that's, that sort of stuff. So in my mind, I'm behind schedule on what I plan to talk about. Okay. So I'll try and get through this. I'll probably try and go a little faster through this life history stuff than I thought. But you know, like I said, this is the first time I'm giving it. I just had to, had to figure it out. So I may rush a little bit here okay. in this part. But <coughs> So we can get to the invasive insect stuff at about oh, 10 after 11 or so. Okay. So <coughs> again, I was asked to come talk about insect ecology, and insect and ecology is, you know, the branch of biology dealing with the relationship of organisms to one another, to their physical surroundings. Um, so it takes in, you know. Insect ecology could be pretty much anything, right? Right. <laughs> ecology is pretty much anything. It's what interests you in dealing with the dealing with the world. Two terms that are probably important talking about ecology: things that oh, you might go, oh, habitat and, and niche, and then you try and really think about what they are. And it's kind of hazy. Um, so I went through and sat down in habitat. We talk about habitat, it's pretty much the physical environment around something, around a, an organism. Whereas the niche is what that organism does in its world, what its job is, what its life is, what role it's fulfilling. So these are two concepts that come up in talking about ecology a lot. And it's good to have a bit of a feel for what they mean. So when we're talking about ecology, and we're talking about habitat, habitat takes in a lot of things around you that are not part of you living. Things like sunlight and temperature. These are called the abiotic factors. These, if we're talking about an insect, it's like what abiotic factors have an impact on it? Um, how much light does it need? How much darkness does it need? Does it need to be in a warm place or a cool place? Does it need a lot of precipitation or moisture? Or does it need to be in a dry area? And even wind. You know, some insects live in very windy places and others um, not so much. So these, talking about ecology, are always keeping in mind these kinds of abiotic factors that might have an impact on the organism you're considering. So for insects, one of the things that comes up from time to time is a concept called degree day. And this has to do with temperature. So we try and predict for like for insect pests, we try and predict when they're going to be around, so we know when to treat them. And, and a way to pre predict is if you understand what kind of temperature requirements they have, um, you can make a model and try and figure out when they're going to be here. So they've got this concept called degree day, and an insect, let's say. Insect A that we're interested in will only be able 
able to develop when the temperature reaches a certain threshold. If it's 50 degrees out, it can't develop. If it's 55 degrees, it can grow. So try, when trying to figure out will the insect be around, part of it's going to be, is it ever above 55 degrees around here? And if it is, if it's not, you don't have to worry about that insect surviving where you are. If it does get above 55 degrees, every day that it's above 55 degrees, that's a time when it can be feeding, growing, and developing. So uh, one of the things we'll do is look at the temperature. And the insect that we're interested in, um, figure out how often it's been above its threshold temperature. And if it's been above its threshold temperature very often, you know, it can grow fast. If it's just gotten above it a little bit every once in a while, it's going to take a long time for it to, to, to develop. Um, so one insect we're interested in is cherry fruit fly. And the, farm, the people that are raising cherries, they have to spray pesticides when that fruit fly is out laying its eggs. So we calculate every year um, the, the threshold temperature that it can start developing at. We calculate how many hours every day it's gotten above that temperature, starting from January 1st. And based on that, we can predict when it might start hatching without even seeing the insect. So, so since the temperature is weird up here, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, it, it gets warm and then it can develop, but what about if it gets cold when it's still in that cycle, will it kill it? Generally, no, it'll just stop developing. Oh. oh. Unless it got to some really, really, really bad temperature. You know, like they have a temperature where they, it has to get above this temperature for them to develop. A lot of insects probably would have a certain temperature where if it got this cold, they'd die for sure. But usually it's really extremely cold, like a week at minus 20 degrees or something. Uh, then it would kill it. Um, but for the degree day thing, we're trying to predict how fast it's going to develop. So on a, in a year when spring's warm, they're going to come out earlier. And in years when spring's cold and rainy, drizzly, they're going to come out slower. And we can predict sometimes with some pretty good accuracy when they're going to be out. It depends on how much we know about the insect. We can predict when they'll be out by keeping track of the temperature um, from day to day. Um, so that's talking about some of the abiotic factors that we think about when we're talking about insect ecology. When we're talking about insect ecology, we're also thinking about all the factors of the insect interacting with living creatures. Um, when the insect has to feed, it's going to feed on something living, right? It's going to feed on other insects, it's going to feed on plants. So depending on what its food is doing, that's going to have an effect on the survival of the insect. It's going to interact with other insects in the sense that it just comes into contact with them. Uh, either it bumps into them because they're in the same area, or it feeds on them, or something feeds on it. It has natural enemies. You know, pretty much every living organism out there has something that is an enemy of it. And I put enemies in quotation marks. Because when you think about natural enemies, you think of, here's an insect, and it's got this other insect that wants to kill it. And that's its natural enemy. But it goes beyond that, too. I mean, sometimes if they're just competing for food or competing for spaces, they're still enemies in one sense. Even though the insect B is not out to kill insect A, it could do things that, that do that impact the survival of insect A. So it's an enemy in some sense. There are also things called symbionts. Symbionts are organisms that
do better when they're in the presence of another organism. Sometimes they have to have that other organism around to survive. Or other times they just get along so well that they help each other out just because they are in the same place. So we'll talk a little bit about symbionts in, in a few minutes. So we're concerned with insects feeding. We're concerned with insects interacting with other organisms. We're also concerned with how insects reproduce and grow. This is going to affect their survival. If they have certain requirements to reproduce, or they reproduce in certain ways, uh, their success of survival is going to depend on whether they're able to successfully fit, fill these requirements. If they need moisture, if they need certain plants, uh, if the right conditions are there, they'll survive and thrive. If the conditions aren't there, they're going to go extinct. And then another thing to consider about insects is they're not always in the same place. You know, they got wings, they got legs, they move. And their ability to move into a place, to move out of a place, their ability for neighbors to move into their places and out, this immigration and emigration will affect the survival and the ecology of the insect or the organism that we're talking about. So if we're talking about feeding, um, again, I think you're probably aware, insects, million different kinds of insects, they feed on uh, different kinds of things. A lot of insects are feeding on our plants, so they're herbivores. A lot of insects are feeding on each other, and they're carnivores. Some feed on plants and other animals. And then there's the whole group of insects that are detritivores that eat garbage, trash, dead things. You know, kind of laugh and go, hmm, that's kind of disgusting. But naturally, if they didn't, we'd be buried in garbage, trash, uh, dead things. So the insects play a big role in helping to rid the world of the things we don't need or don't want or, or would just choke us to death if it was all around. So these are some big classes of, of uh, feeding. And so if we said, okay, what do insects eat? It'd probably be easier to say, what don't insects eat? Because with a million plus kinds of insects, they pretty much get into just about everything. I mean, what don't insects eat? Plastic, though I bet you could find some that do. But general, in general, they don't eat plastic, don't eat glass, don't eat you know, minerals, rocks, and stuff very much. But beyond that, you know, that just about any kind of plant you can think of, they're on it. Just about any kind of animal, animal byproduct, they're on it. There's something that eats it. Uh, I read about some insect once that chewed through lead cables. I'm not sure if he was really feeding on the lead or it was just trying to get from point A to point B. It had to go through lead cables and did it successfully. Um, they're very industrious and, again, if you decided to make an insect collection, you'd say, oh, I don't know where I could go to find an insect. Because insects feed on just about anything, you could go just about anywhere. You could sit in your house, lift up the rug, you know, go in your pantry, you go out in your garden, you go out and look on your pets, you could go sit out in a lawn chair, and the ski this will be landed on you. And anything you can think of, some, there's probably some insect somewhere that will eat it. So if we talk about these, these term natural enemies that I was uh, brought up. Natural enemies uh, can be the same species of insect uh, because they're competing with each other. They are competing for food, they're competing, competing for space. And you might have seen ants out having ant wars. Sometimes it's two different species of ants attacking each other. 
Sometimes it's the same species because they're just, you're in my space. We got a colony here. Let's take up this much room. You guys, put your colony over there. And get out of here. We need this space. A lot of times you'll find insects that are feeding on plants. And there'll be a whole cluster of insects on the same leaf or on the same plant. And sometimes they get along, and other times they're competing for that space and the, and the food. Uh, their term natural enemies, insects sometimes are competing for the same kind of food, and they're not the same species that are competing for the same kind of food. You go out on a plant and you see aphids out on the plant. Everyone's gone out, seen aphids on their plant, seen ladybugs eating aphids and going, all right. Mm -hmm. Now here's the natural thing we like to see. Here's the aphids. Here's the, ant the, here's the ladybugs <coughs> eating the aphids. Ladybugs, aphids bad. Ladybugs good. This is the way it should be. But, you know, the ladybug, you look carefully, there's ladybugs eating the aphids out there. Uh, in a lot of situations, you look and you'll see lacewing larvae on the far left. They look a little bit different from ladybug larvae. Lacewing lace larvae feed on aphids also. They'll often be in there chewing up the aphids. Up at the top is a surfid fly larva. So you might see this maggot crawling along and eating the aphids. It's a fly and the maggot eats aphids. Down at the bottom I was talking about parasitic wasps laying their eggs inside insects to eat the insects, to our parasite wasp lay their eggs in aphids. So here you have aphids, and you have these four different insects all competing for the aphid um, food source. So there is you know, natural enemies competing with each other, different species competing for the same spaces, for the same um, food sources. Natural enemies are also got insect A and it's got its predators that are coming after to feed on it. Again, prey mantis feeding on insects that come to flowers is a classic example. Here on the far left is an assassin bug. It does the same thing the prey mantis do except it's got that sucking mouth part. Crow walks around plants, grabs insects, sucks their blood out. That's how it makes its living. It's a predator of many insects. Top right is more parasitic wasps. This time they're laying their, egg, their eggs inside the egg of probably some kind of moth up there. Parasitic wasp comes, lays its egg in the moth egg, and the grub of the wasp eats the uh, animal inside the egg before the egg even hatches. Down the bottom is a caterpillar, a hornworm caterpillar. It had parasitic wasp larvae inside it, mm. eat, eating their way out. They came out and they're making their cocoons now. So they are the natural enemy of the hornworm caterpillar. Big complexes of enemies, of predators feeding on other insects. Um, there are things out there attacking the insects. that They aren't predators on the insects but they do uh, impact their survival. Parasites, they don't specifically go out trying to eat the insect, but they feed on the insect, um, not to kill it, but often they weaken the insect. Sometimes the insect dies. <coughs> Things like diseases. Over on the right is a caterpillar that had a bacteria disease or a fungus disease or a viral disease. The virus and didn't really want to kill its host, but there are enough in there that eventually it weakens and dies. Um, on the left is a, a little tiny fly um, that's sucking the blood out of a caterpillar. The thing it's standing on is a caterpillar. It's not killing the caterpillar like those parasitic wasps, but you know, if it sucks enough blood out of that caterpillar enough times, enough of those flies come. It can weaken the caterpillar and, and uh, eventually the caterpillar dies. So a lot of insects out there have enemies that are putting pressures on them. They can kill their, 
kill them or lower their populations. And then I mentioned a little while ago the term symbionts, things that get along with each other. Uh, that's happening out there in nature a lot. Here in the center, you've got these ants. And ants um, sometimes feed on, they farm aphids. So over on the right, up the top, we've got a picture of an ant. Is there are aphids on the plant. And the aphids are sucking the sap out of the plant. And when they do that, uh, this sweet liquid comes out of their tail end. And we call it honeydew. And the ants love to eat that. So the ants are like farmers for these aphids. They go up, they crawl, walk around the aphids, they lick the honeydew off the aphids. And what, are, what do the aphids get out of this? The ant, the aphids have enemies like parasitic wasps and ladybugs.